I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew, chapter 25. We'll be reading the first 13 verses of the chapter. Matthew 24 and 25 comprise what is called the Olivet Discourse. And what is that? That is the last sermon, uh, full sermon that the Lord Jesus preached that was recorded. And uh, it's largely instructions in answer to three questions. The three questions given in the early part of uh, chapter 24 are, when shall these things be? He's talked about things to come. The disciples asked him, when? When shall these things be? Question number two, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Coming for what? Coming to be the king, the Messiah, to set up his kingdom here on earth. And question three, what shall be the sign of the end of the world? So chapters 24 and 25, he answers all of those questions. We're not going to go through all of that today. We're just going to look at the story, a parable that Jesus gave in chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. We'll read it, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, so look at it together with me, if you will. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they slumbered, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not, be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not, or, I'm sorry, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. It's a tremendous parable here, and we're going to take a look at it and compare it with some other scriptures and see exactly what the Lord is saying here. Right now, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We ask your blessing on it. Pray that you give us what we need from it in this hour. Help us, Lord, to always be cognizant of the fact that you are speaking to us when we open the Bible. So by your Holy Spirit, teach us and guide us into all truth today. And we trust that same Holy Spirit to take this truth home to our hearts. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. Again, Lord, if there's a soul listening who doesn't know you as Savior, may they come to trust Jesus and be saved in this hour. For those who do know you, may we prepare to meet our God. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Amos chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, the Lord said to Israel, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. What? Amos, the prophet, was saying to the people of Israel in his day, hundreds of years later, the Lord Jesus was saying in this parable, prepare to meet thy God. Each of us needs to be prepared to meet God. Each of us is going to meet God. We need to get ready. We're going to meet him either at his return or we're going to meet him through the gateway of death. But one way or the other, we will meet God. So the Lord Jesus here is going to use traditions of the first century wedding to illustrate the need to prepare for his return. 
Take a look at verse 1, if you will. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. This was the tradition of the day. I want to read to you from the Life Application Bible. That is not a new version of the Bible. That's a Bible with some commentary uh, added to it. And the commentary says this. This parable is about a wedding. On the wedding day, the bridegroom went to the bride's house for ceremony. Then the bride and groom, along with a great parade, returned to the groom's house where a feast took place, often lasting a full week. The virgins, the bridesmaids, you think bridesmaids, were waiting for the parade, and they hoped to take part in the wedding banquet. But when the groom didn't come at the expected time, five of them were out of lamp oil. It was too late for them to join the feast. When Jesus returns to take his people to heaven, we must be ready. Spiritual preparation cannot be bought or borrowed at the last minute. Our relationship with God must be our own, end quote. Schofield Reference Bible comments on the same passage and says the kingdom of heaven here is the sphere of profession, as in Matthew 13. All alike have lamps, but two facts fix the real status of the foolish virgins. One, they took no oil, and the Lord said, I know you not. Oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Nor could the Lord say to any believer, however unspiritual, I know you not. So those who have the oil have the Holy Spirit, and they represent the believers. The unbeliever does not have the Holy Spirit. The believer, when you trust Jesus as your Savior, the Spirit of God takes up residence with you. And you have the Holy Spirit. Again, Romans 8, 9. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Same writer that wrote that wrote 1 Corinthians three sixteen, which says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you, lives in you. Now look at verse 2. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. They only had the oil that was in the lamp, no extra. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So we have the idea here that those who just took enough oil, enough life really, and they came to the end and they ran out. Those who had the oil or had the Holy Spirit had an abundance. They had enough to share and yet they did not come empty before the bridegroom came. Now look at verse 5. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. That's normal. See, the tradition of the day was that the bridegroom would go away for approximately a year, and he would re go to prepare a house. Jesus talks about this in John 14. But he would go prepare a house for he and his new bride to live in. It would be their house, be their home. It would be either in a case of a family that, that didn't have a great deal of land or money, they would build an addition onto the father's house, but if there was enough land, they would build a free standing house. But he would go and take about a year to get the house ready, and then he would come back for the wedding feast. Now, he, they didn't have a set date for the wedding feast. It was about a year. So they knew about when he was coming, but they didn't know exactly when he was coming. Why did they do it that way? Well, he didn't know exactly how long it was going to take him to finish the work. So when he would come, his friend would go ahead of him and announce the bridegroom is coming. Then everybody knows it's time to get ready. The bridegroom's coming, and they're going to have the marriage. And then, as Life Application Bible told us, they would all walk in a parade to go to the new home and celebrate there. And sometimes, as it said, that feast would last several days, up to a week. Later in the Revelation, it talks to us, the end of chapter 19, about the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the same concept, the same idea. And so this is symbolic. Jesus is using the imagery of the wedding to 
talk about his coming. So look at verse 5 again. While the bridegroom tarried, they didn't know exactly when he was coming. They knew about when he was coming. They, they went to sleep. It was probably late at night. Verse 6, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. That's the forerunner. John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus. He prepared people for the coming of Jesus the first time. Two witnesses will come in the Revelation to prepare people for the return of Jesus, not at the rapture, but to return to set up his kingdom. Those two witnesses will do the same miracles and do many of the same things, say many of the same things, do many of the same things that Moses did and that Elijah did. And it's clearly identified that one of them is uh, Elijah. The other one almost certainly is Moses. Some people think it's Enoch. But uh, these are the two men. One, Moses, representing those who have died and gone to be with the Lord. And Elijah, representing those who were taken out of the world without death. Or we would say were caught away or raptured. Now some think it was definitely Enoch because he's another who was taken up without dying. But the description fits Moses and Elijah. And I add to that that in the Gospel of John, when Jesus meets with uh, two men, on the, meets with his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's changed into his glorified state in front of them. Two men meet with him, and that's Moses and Elijah. So it's most likely those are the two. And they are performing the work of John the Baptist to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. Verse 7, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The uh, wick gets uh, burnt down, so they brought the wick up and trimmed it off so there'd be fresh wick to burn. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. They didn't have any more oil for the lamp. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, notice that, they that were ready went in with the, him to the marriage, and the door was shut. The door was shut. I want to read to you a couple other passages of Scripture. If you want to turn, you can, but we're going to go quickly. I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and Revelation 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 50, Paul writes, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, Paul's euphemism for death. We're not all going to die, but we shall all be changed. How long will that change take? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. For the last at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise, I'm sorry, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning at verse 13. Same writer says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first then, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We get a picture of that in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, where John writes, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice that I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately... I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow 
round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Verse 2 again, immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. In all of those passages, the trumpet sounds. And when the trumpet sounds, the dead are raised and they are caught up into heaven to be with the Lord forever and they are changed. So you have two passages written by Paul, one written by John, and then you have the Lord's teaching on the same subject here. Uh, if God tells us something once in his word, that's important. If he tells it to us repeatedly, we're supposed to sit up and take notice. In 1 Corinthians 15, they are changed from mortal to immortal, from corruptible to incorruptible. In 1 Thessalonians 4, the dead are raised and caught up with the living to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord as the bride goes home with her husband forever. In Revelation 4, John hears the sound of the trumpet. He's caught up into the presence of the Lord. It is evident that all these passages describe the same event. And it's the same thing that Jesus is talking about here in these first 13 verses of Matthew 25. Now look at verse 7 again, if you will. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but rather go to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. The door was shut. Those who were ready went home. Those who were ready got into the feast. Those who were ready got to the marriage supper. But then the door was shut. Let me read to you another passage from Genesis chapter 7, verses 15 and 16. And they went into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. Do you understand that? When Noah and his family got into the ark, when all the animals got into the ark, Noah did not close the door. There was only one door in the ark. Only one way to get into the ark. And that's go through the door. And the time came when the judgment of God was going to fall. And Noah did not close the door. God closed the door. God said, no more. You had your opportunity. You had your choice. No more. Only those who were in the ark were saved. There comes a time when God slams the door. The ark, we're told, was in preparing for a hundred years. So there was a hundred years in which people had the opportunity to hear Noah's message and believe in God. A hundred years in which people had opportunity to get into the ark. Well, was the ark built big enough for the whole population of the earth? Probably not. Well, how is that fair? Well, God knew who was going to come, who wasn't, didn't he? He knew how big the ark needed to be made. But that doesn't change the fact that people still had a choice. It doesn't change the fact that people have a choice today. And you can decide, you can choose whether you're going to follow the one way to be saved or whether you're going to go some other way and go your own way, which is what the majority of people do. They decide to go their own way. Notice something else in verse 12. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. When one is saved, we say that they come to know the Lord, and that's, that's not a bad term. They do come to know the Lord. But here the Lord says that he knows the soul or he does not know the soul. So the question becomes this. Is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Is it written there? If you were to go to Revelation chapter 20, you'd find that it says the dead were judged. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the Book of Life. And the dead were judged out of the things uh, that were written therein. And it says some people's names are not in the book of life. It says whosoever's name is not in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Now, that's eternal judgment. It's 
say, well, how do I know if my name's in the book of life or not? Well, you know because you know whether you've been saved or not. You know, there's a little song that we sometimes sing. We haven't sung it this year at all. That I, I don't, I'm pretty sure we haven't. But uh, sometimes sing a song says, if you're saved and you know it, say amen. You know what? You, you're not going to be saved and not know it. You know, my goodness, I was saved. I never knew I was. That's, that's not going to happen. Why? Because there's a specific time and place where you trust the Lord as your Savior, where you made a conscious decision to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was just a boy uh, in the bedroom in our house, there was a plaque on the wall. And written on that plaque were the words of John 3.16. And I read it, and I could read it. I could read just fine, but I did not fully understand it. So did I know what John 3.16 said? I did. Did I trust the Lord? Did I believe? And was I saved at that point? No, I was not. It would be many years later before I would come to know the Lord. I knew about him, but it would be many years later before I came to know him. If I had to, we could all get in a, a bus and I could take you down to the place and show you uh, where I was saved, or at least the general location. I don't think the building's still there, but I could show you the location where I trusted the Lord as my Savior. You ought to be able to do that. You ought to be able to say, I, I know where I was saved. Last year, last year, and I think it was in late May, a uh, young lady came by one day, and I did not recognize her at first. She told me her name, and then I knew who she was. I hadn't seen her since she was a young girl, and now she's a young woman. And she came by one afternoon. She said, I want to show you something. I said, okay. She said, follow me. She walked out the front door here, turned right on the little ramp that slants, slants down this way, took me down to the end of that little ramp, and she pointed and said, right there, right there is where I was saved. She said, I want you to know that. Right there is where I was saved. Now, you, you ought to be able to know when and where you got saved. You should. You should know your decision. Well, don't I just gradually get saved? No, you don't get gradually saved. You get saved the moment you trust Jesus as your Savior. He forgives your sins. Well, I've always believed. Well, Perhaps you've always believed. I always believed in God. I was never an atheist. It was a big shock in my life, and I mean that sincerely. It was a big shock in my life when I found out there were people who didn't believe in God. I thought, why, why would you not believe in God? You know, everything that we have was designed or invented by somebody. If you have a watch, somebody invented the watch. If you look at a clock, somebody invented the clock. You use the computer, somebody invented the computer. Somebody developed the software. Somebody developed the hardware. Somebody developed all of that. We don't have any trouble believing that. You're sitting on a pew that somebody made in a factory and somebody else assembled and somebody else upholstered. You don't have any trouble believing that, and yet we're gonna believe that the universe and everything in it and everybody on the planet Earth all just happened without anybody designing or making it. How absurd is that? I do not understand people who don't believe in God. I am going to tell you this. It is my sincere belief that most people, and I, I don't say this is everybody, I'm sure there are exceptions to this. Some people are t brought up being taught not to believe in God, being taught that God is a myth, being caught that those who believe in God are misguided and foolish. But most people who say there is no God, they know full well in their heart that there is a God. They know that. So why do they say it? Because they're angry with God. They don't like God. God either didn't do something they thought he should do or he did something they thought he shouldn't do. Well, if there's a God, he wouldn't have let my little sister die. I'm not trying to be cold to anybody. Please understand that. It's not my purpose. But everybody dies. So if your little sister died, that's not God punishing you or being unkind to you. It was simply her time. We all miss people when they die. We all miss children, particularly when they die. And it's not easy, and I'm not trying to make light of it. But I'm saying we need to come to the honest realization that death comes to all of us. 
There are no exceptions. It's just a matter of when. Everybody here, including me, our, our lives are on earth are going to end. Some sooner, some later. But they're going to end for all of us. So, the question is, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Now, what's interesting, too, is that some people's names are blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, we could talk about what that means and speculate on it a little bit, but I'm not going to take time to do that right now. I'm going to tell you that if you have trusted the Lord as your Savior, if you've been born again, if you came to the realization that you, like everybody else on this planet, and everybody else who ever has lived on this planet or ever will live on this planet, with exception of one person, that would be Jesus himself. We've all sinned. We've all done something that violates the word of God and the will of God. And the wages of sin is death for all of us, not for some of us, for all of us. As I said earlier, it's just a matter of time. And so one day we are all going to stand before God. We're all going to meet our creator. When we meet our creator, I'll tell you some things God isn't going to ask us. He doesn't have a checklist he's going to check off to see if you, you met the certain requirements. He's not going to say, well, let's see. Um, were you a church member? Okay, check. You were a church member. Were you a good church member? Well, what do you mean by good? Well, were you there faithfully and regularly and did you participate? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's me. Okay, check. Um, oh, oh, before you were a church member, did you get baptized? Yeah, I got baptized. Check. Okay. Um, well, uh, how about giving? Did you give the church? Yeah, I did. Check. How about, how did you treat other people? Were you good to other people? Yeah, I was, I was always good to everybody. Okay, check. He's not going to check off things like that. The question is not going to be, what did you do or not do? The question is, did you trust Jesus to save your soul? Because he is the only Savior. Isaiah 43, I, even I, am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Paul writes and he says, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one. There was only one door in the ark. In Noah's day, there was only one way to be saved, get in the ark. People didn't get in the ark and the door was shut. And I imagine, and I've told you this before, I imagine when the water began to rise, people probably came and they were banging on the side of the ark saying, Noah, Noah, let us in, let us in. But the door was shut. Noah didn't shut the door. God slammed the door. And so that's what we see here in verse 11. Afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Your name is not in the book of life. It's not here. Now the analogy is this. They did not have the Holy Spirit. And they did not have the Holy Spirit because they had not been saved. Born again believers, we said this earlier. Let me explain it a little bit different way. When you trust Jesus as your Savior, it says we receive Christ. Well, is that a biblical term, receive Christ? Yes, John chapter 1 and Verse 11 says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So those who have received Christ, you don't get a third of the Godhead. You receive the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes to live in you. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He promised, the Lord promised his presence with you in this life until he returns. And that's the Holy Spirit living in you, working in you guiding you into truth, helping you understand the scriptures, helping you make right decisions, empowering you to do God's work and God's will, all of it, all of it. The Holy Spirit gives us power. Now, there are degrees of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. There is no degree of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Everybody has the Holy Spirit. Well, how is there a degree of the fullness of the Spirit? To the degree that you surrender yourself to him and you give him room to work in your life, He'll give you a greater sense of his power.
to the degree that you fill yourself up with the cares of this life and your own selfish desires and intents, you'll have a lessening of the power, but you still have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What are you saying? You're saying, I need to surrender myself completely to the Lord? That's exactly what I'm saying. So then we come to the 13th and final verse in this parable. Jesus said, watch, therefore. Now, watch, you mean we're supposed to be looking at the sky, looking for the Lord's return? Well, you can do that. I don't think that's necessarily wrong to do that. I heard one man say one day, he said he got up every morning, got out of his bed, went over the room, I'm sorry, meant to say went over to the window of his room and looked up at the sky and said, Lord, is it today? Is it wrong to do that? It's not wrong to do that. But that's not all that's meant here by the word watch. The word watch means be on guard. Somebody who's under watch is on guard. I read just this week and, and read this all too often about a police officer who was killed in the line of duty. And you know what they call that when the police officer is killed in the line of duty? They call it end of watch. They had their time. They had their time to be on duty. They had their time to be on guard. They had their time to serve and protect. But they've come to the end of their watch. Their duty is finished. But they are on guard. Officers are there to keep peace. Officers are there to enforce the law. Just think of a soldier being on guard. I tell you that uh, those who stand on guard duty have a serious, serious duty. They may guard a gate. They may guard something else. I, I think I might have told this story here recently. I, I don't remember for sure. Uh, told it somewhere recently. But back in 2010, our family got a chance to go to uh, England and Wales and Ireland. And our first night there, we were in London. We flew, flew into London, and we were just walking around. We didn't really know much about where we were going. We were just walking around the city. And we saw... Uh, this man standing guard, and he was uh, one of those royal guardsmen that you've heard about with the big hat and the red uniform and all that. It wasn't at Buckingham Palace. It was an archway that he was standing in front of. We didn't know what it was. And he stood there, as you've always heard, he didn't move, he didn't speak, he didn't do anything. He just stood there like a statue. And so we walked past him, walked into the, the archway there, and when we walked out the other side of the archway, it wasn't very long, there was a big open field there, kind of a gravel uh, area. I, I thought it was a large parking lot. That's what it looked like. There weren't any vehicles in it. And so uh, I just was looking around. I, I was wondering what this is that this man was guarding. Didn't look like a whole lot. Off to our left, I saw two police officers standing in front of a gate. So I walked over to the two police officers, and I said, uh, excuse me, I'm not from around here. I think they knew that. I said, I'm not from around here. What is, what is this area out here that we're looking at? And they said, that is the royal parade ground. That's where the queen at that time said, that's where the queen can review her troops. I said, oh, really? I said, well, what's this big building there? And they said, it's the old admiralty uh, where the headquarters of the Navy said, there's a new one. That's the old one. They've kept it there. And I said, well, and what is this building that, that you two officers are guarding? And they looked at me and said, this is the back door to number 10 Downing Street. That is equivalent in our country to the White House. That is the home of the Prime Minister of England. I had no idea that that was where we were standing. But they were standing there standing guard. Now, had I tried to go through that gate, I'm pretty sure they would have stopped me. I was amazed that that's where I was. I tell you that story to tell you this, standing guard is an important duty. And being on guard to protect, being on guard to serve, being on guard to watch and be ready for whatever happens and to perform your duty. John Wesley said that it's one of the most important purposes of a man's life is to do his duty. That's not, you don't do duty in order to get saved. You do duty because you've been saved. What is your duty? Your duty is to live for the Lord, to draw other people to the Lord, and to go on as a witness and a testimony for him. That is your duty. It's my duty. And be ready. So the first step in watching and being ready, he says, watch therefore, for you know 
neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh the first step is to know that you're saved. We already said you can know that you're saved. 1 John 5, verses 11 13. This is the record, like a written record, like a title to your car, the deed to your house. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son has life. He that hath not the Son has not life. These things have I written unto you. Listen, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Stop right there. The more to the verse, stop right there. These things are written to those who believe in the name of the Son of God. What is the name of the Son of God? What is it? A little louder? Okay. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. So this is written to people who believe in Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if you have believed in Jesus, you put your faith and trust in Jesus, then that would be written to you, wouldn't it? That's what it says. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know, not guess, not think, not hope so, not maybe, not holding out, waiting. You may know that you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can know that you have eternal life. Why? Because you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. That's 1 John 5, 11 to 13. Verse 1 of that same chapter says this. He that believeth that Jesus, or whosoever, it says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. What does that mean? Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you believe that 2,000 years ago a man walked this planet and his name was Jesus and his last name was Christ. That's not not what it means at all. Christ is not his last name. His name is Jesus. We've already established that. Christ is his title. It means the anointed one, the sent one. It means the Savior. So if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're believing that he is the Savior. Whose Savior? Yours. See, I trust Jesus to save me. That doesn't save you. You trust Jesus save you. That doesn't save me. Each one of us must come and put our faith in him individually. And each one of us has that choice and that opportunity. So be ready. The first step is to know that you're saved. The second step we've already talked about is watching to be on guard. Guard your heart, the Bible tells us. For out of it are the issues of life. You need to protect your heart to stay in a right fellowship with the Lord. There's temptation all around us. We say here all the time, we'll say it again, what tempts you may not tempt me at all. There may be things that trouble you and, and you have struggles with that I don't struggle with at all. But the reverse is also true. What tempts me may not tempt you at all. But we all have our temptations. There are all things that, that cause us to stumble. All things that cause us to give all have things that cause us to give in to our selfish desires. Be on guard. Be on guard against the attacks of the enemy. Who is the enemy? You know, when I, when I was saved, when Pastor Richard Shermerhorn took a Bible similar to this one and sat down with me, explained to me how to be saved. I'd never had anybody explain it to me before. Explained to me how to be saved. I bowed my head and I called on the Lord and I asked him to save me. As soon as I trusted the Lord as my Savior, Pastor Shermerhorn said to me, he says, you know, you just made an enemy. I said, yes. He said, you know who it is? I said, I think I do. He says, who is it? I said, Satan. He said, you're right. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober. That means be serious. doesn't mean just don't use alcohol and drugs. It, it, that's included in it, but it means more than that. It means be of a serious mind. Be sober. Be vigilant. That means be on the watch. Be watchful. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the one who is against you, your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I'm going to tell you something. The devil's out to get you, and he'll get you if he can. What do you mean by that? I'll tell you what I mean by that. Satan is a terrorist. He has already fought God and, and lost. Are you saying that terrorism is satanic? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's following the pattern of Satan. Satan is a terrorist. He's already fought God and lost. He will not fight God again. He knows he can't win. So he does what the terrorist does. He can't win fighting God, but he'll attack that which God loves in order to grieve the heart of God. 
Do you know what God loves? You. You are what God loves. And Satan will attack you. That's his way of getting at God. That's the way terrorists operate. They don't come with an army and fight another army face to face. They go blow up a bus or blow up a schoolhouse or blow up a shopping center. Or they take a rifle and mow down scores of innocent people. That's satanic. Are, are, are you condemning bombings and mass shootings? Yes. If you thought that, you got it exactly right. That is the work of Satan. And I'm, my personal belief is that most of these mass shootings are perpetrated by people who are demon-possessed. Why do you think so? Because Jesus says in John 10, The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The thief he's talking about is Satan himself. And not every time, but more often than not, what do you find happen? Somebody goes and they shoot a bunch of innocent people, most cases people they don't even know, and they take the lives, they steal, and they destroy the innocent lives, and they damage the families of those innocent people. And then what's the next thing they do? Kill themselves. Why do they do that? Demon's finished with them. Done the work that he had them to do. He's finished with them, so kill them too. You don't really think that I do. I do. I could give you more evidence of that, but we not our main point this morning. I'm going to move on. Sound to me like you're condemning that kind of activity. You're, you're catching on. You are. Watching is to be on guard. Step one, know that you're saved. Step two, be on guard. We're talking about preparing to meet God. You're not prepared to meet God till you've been saved. Then you need to be watching on guard. The third step is don't go home alone. We're not going to read it, but the next passage in this chapter, verses 14 down to verse 30, the parable of the talents, is about people who are given talents and they go out and some of them invest and they get more and one guy takes his and buries it. We're not supposed to go home alone. We're supposed to take other people with us. When we leave this earth and we go to stand before the Lord, we're supposed to take other people with us. How many are you going to have with you, preacher? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I, I, I don't know how many people have been saved because of my influence. Do you think anybody has? I do. I do think people have. But how many? I, I don't know. Let me, let me tell you something that happened to me many years ago, decades ago. This would be back in the 1970s. I was working in a factory and uh, up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And um, I witnessed to pretty much everybody in that factory. Tried to share the gospel with everybody. As far as I knew, not one person got saved. I talked to many of them. When I first got saved, I was a senior in high school, and I had an art class where we had a large table, and there were five or six of us sitting around at the same table. and. I got saved and I came in, I gave everybody, it was all guys, I gave them all a track. And uh, one of them read the track and, and uh, took it folded up, put it in his pocket and didn't say a word. Another one read the track and he took it and he said, Jesus Christ, what is this? Wadded the track up, threw it in my face. Another guy read his track and he said, hey, this is wrong. I said, it is, what's wrong with it? He says, you got to be baptized to be saved. I said, oh, no, and I was a new believer, folks. I didn't know much about what different churches taught. I said, no, no, you got that wrong. I said, you need to go talk to your pastor and let him straighten you out on that. I didn't know his pastor had taught him that. I, I had no idea that the pastor would do that. And one fella took his track and read it, and he came to our church, not this church, this where I was in church at that time, and he was saved. Now, here's what I'm telling you. Time went by from that day in school and from that working in that factory. I witnessed to many people as I could there, tried to get to everybody. I didn't see any fruit. Years went by. One day in Chattanooga, I no longer worked at that factory. I was driving down the street in a residential area. That's important to know because... What happened couldn't have happened if we'd been out on a highway or something. Drive down the street in a residential area, and a car was coming the other way. Neither one of us going very fast. And the guy 
guy made motion for me to stop, so I stopped. And he leaned out the window of his car and he said, hey, remember me? And I did. One of the fellas I, I worked with there at that uh, factory. He said, yeah, I remember you. He says, I got great news for you. I said, what's that? He says, I've been saved. Now, did I lead him to the Lord? No. But he had gotten saved. He wanted to tell me about it. And that's great. Sometime after that, I was out on bus visitation. We'd go out every Saturday and visit for a bus route and run the bus on Sunday, pick up people and take them to church. I was out on bus visitation. I saw a group of children standing in the street. So I stopped to talk to them. A man looked out the window of his house, saw this stranger talking to his children. He thought, I better go see who this is and what's going on. He came out and reckoned there was another guy who had worked at that factory. He said, man, am I glad to see you. I didn't know that was you when I came out. Glad to see you. He says, I got something to tell you. I said, what's that? He says, my wife and I and our children here, we all got saved. And we go to, and they named the church they went to. That's great. Well, let's go back to that art class. The guy who wadded up the track threw it in my face. I was out on visitation one day. And somebody had given us a... a prospect card to go out and call on some people and I went out and knocked on the door of this house and who opens the door but that guy who watered up that track and threw it in my face he said he was an atheist he said he didn't believe in God do you know what he told me that day when he opened that door he said I got to tell you something I've been saved what I'm telling you is you don't know who you're influencing for the Lord you may be talking to people I'm not saying you don't you just live the life and don't talk about it because let me tell you what's wrong with that you ought to live a good example you ought to live a good Christian life but if that's all you do and you never say a word you know what people are going to think they're going to think what a good person you are but they're not going to know who it is that makes you a good person you have to be able to speak up and let them know that you're a good person because you've trusted the Lord Jesus and he's changed your life that's the only way they're going to know well, what I'm telling you is you may speak to somebody and you may give a track or you may witness somebody and they don't get saved then and there. Now, sometimes they do, and thank God for that. Uh, we had, I had one of our members here call me this week, and I wasn't able to get the phone right then. He left a message for me to call him back. I called him back, and he said, hey, got something big to tell you. He says, uh, one of my coworkers got saved. It says, uh, I'm going to be bringing him to church. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? That's the way it should be. What I'm trying to tell you is this. You don't know who you've influenced. You don't know who you spoke to that you thought they didn't get it. They didn't hear it. They didn't understand. But you sowed a seed. Paul says one sows the seed, somebody else waters, somebody else reaps the harvest. You may have planted that seed and it may grow to bear fruit that you didn't even know about. So how many are going to go with you to heaven? I don't know, but i tell you this. The more seed you sow, the more people are going to be there. And that's what the parable of the talents teaches us. You don't sow any seed, don't expect any harvest. The more seed you sow, the greatest harvest you're going to have. So step one. Be sure that you're saved. Step two, be watching on guard. Third step, step three, don't go home alone. Step four, you know neither the day or the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So always be ready. Always be ready. Pastor Shermhorn led me. The Lord told us this. I don't know if this was original with him. It may have been, may not have been. But he told us this. said, you need to be ready to pray, preach, or die at any minute. Be ready to pray, preach, or die at any minute. I'm going to go a step farther with that. So you need to be ready for the Lord to return at any minute. He said he's come, coming. He did everything else he said he would do. No reason to think he won't do that. He said he would come, but he said nobody knows the day or the hour. I was talking to the campers this week about that. I said some people say, well, I know. I got it figured out. And I've read so many books and things about people who say, I figured out when the Lord's coming. I I looked through the scriptures and I looked at this and that and historical events and I, I got it figured out. Whenever somebody tells you that, you know right away they're wrong. How do you know they're wrong? 
Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Chapter 24, verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Well, if the angels in heaven don't know, what makes you think you know? The angels in heaven are with the Father all the time, and they don't know when. But you think you've got it figured out. I remember, uh, some of you old enough to remember this, most of you not, but uh, back then, in 1988, a guy put out a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Must Come in 1988. Was he right? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know what? I didn't even have to read the book to know he wasn't right. Because I read this book. I was in a meeting back in the 70s and heard a man preaching on the return of Christ. Good man, good preaching. And he didn't in any sermon say when the Lord was coming. And I asked him privately. I said, do you talk like you expect the Lord to come soon? He said, I do. I said, your opinion, how long do you think we've got? Now, he said this. He said, I don't want to be pegged as a date setter. He said, I don't want anybody, I don't want you or anybody else to say, I said the Lord's coming at this time because we don't know. But he said, just looking at the circumstances of the world, this is in the 70s, mid-70s. He says, I don't see how it can be much past 1980. Tell you what, folks, it's much past 1980. It is. He wasn't saying the Lord was going to come then. He said it looked like the Lord was coming then. Can I help you with something? The apostles expected the Lord to return in their day. So, well, must be that all you guys are wrong. I mean, it's been 2,000 years, and he hasn't come yet. Let me share this with you, and we're going to close. Number one, the Bible tells us to be ready, to be watching. Number two, God's grace is rich. And he gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to be saved, to get right with him. One day, he slams the door. When you take your last breath, when your heart beats its last beat, when you close your eyes for the final time, your opportunity to choose has gone. Eternity is settled. But let me share this with you to encourage you. And I'm not putting God on a timeline. Understand that. But the first promise that the Redeemer would come was made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. If you measure from that time until the time the Lord Jesus came, it was over 4,000 years. If, and, and listen carefully, you could... Take what I'm about to say and get it wrong. If God was on the same time schedule, and there is nothing that says he is on the same time schedule. Understand that. Nothing at all says he's on the same time schedule. But if he was on the same time schedule, it could be another 2,000 years before the Lord came. Do you really think it's going to be? No, I don't. And I'm not saying that. I'm saying if it took 2,000 more years, he wouldn't be late. God knows the time. You don't know, I don't know, the angels in heaven don't know, but God knows. Do I think it's closer than farther away? Of course. Absolutely. I think we're closer than we've ever been. That's easy to say. And time is running out for everything. But the Lord is coming, and I know that. I know that for sure. I cannot tell you when. We taught the little children a song this week. Jesus will come again, although we don't know when. The countdown's getting lower every day. And it is. It is. So the Lord is coming. He's promised to come. He'll do it. He'll be here. Our job is to be ready. What if, I, what if the Lord doesn't come in my lifetime? Then you still need to be prepared to meet your God. Let me share this with you. It is God's will for men to be saved. It is. Peter writes and he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. But is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everybody to be saved. 
Preacher, I'm glad to hear you say everybody's going to be saved. That's not what I said. I said God wants everybody to be saved, but it is your decision. You're either going to trust Jesus and be saved or you're not. You have to make that decision. I tell you what, if I could make that decision for you, everybody would be saved. But I can't make that decision for you. I can tell you how to be saved. I can show you in God's word how to be saved. I'd be happy to do it. But I can't make the decision for you. You must trust the Lord as your Savior. You must trust him to save you. It's God's will for you to be saved. You have the opportunity to be saved. You could be saved right now. It's God's will for people to be saved and God's will for them to be serving him, doing what's right, living according to his word and his will, and helping other people to come to be saved. Waiting, watching, and serving. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Amos said, prepare to meet thy God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we've had this time together today. It is my prayer that not a person who's in this room today or a person who may be listening electronically would let this day pass by without being certain that they know you as their Savior, that their sins are forgiven, that heaven is their home, that they have eternal life where they'll live with you forever. If there's anyone listening today or anyone who will listen to this later electronically who hasn't already made that decision, hasn't already trusted you to save them, then it's my prayer, Lord, that they would open their heart. They would call on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. I encourage such a one to pray along this line and say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you love me. I believe that even though I'm a sinner, and I am, that you paid for my sins at the cross, and you still love me. I believe that you rose again from the dead and you're alive today, and I'm trusting you right here, right now, to forgive me, to save me, to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe you prayed that prayer with me. Maybe you didn't. But if you're not 100% sure that you've trusted Jesus to save you and you want to trust Jesus to save you, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. I invite you to come. Come to the front here. Meet me. We'll have somebody sit down with you and privately tell you how you can know that you've been saved, how you can know that your sins are forgiven, how you can know that you have a home in heaven. If you're listening online, you can have that same knowledge. Maybe you're thinking, I, that sounds good to me, but I don't fully understand it. I'm not sure how to do it or what to do. Get in touch with us. We'd be glad to help you. Be glad to show you what God's word has to say you will make your own decision we can't do that for you but we can show you what God's word has to say what the Bible says about how to be saved we're happy to do that I suppose most people listening today are going to say preacher I'm already saved thank God for you are you ready to meet your God are you prepared to meet your God if not do you do need to do some business with him this invitation is for you also. You need to pray. You need to come and pray. You need somebody to pray with you. There's a decision you need to make. God's been speaking to you. You need to act upon that. Now is your opportunity. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. You just come while we sing. Father, bless and move. In this invitation time we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.